Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to Don't Do Stupid Shit to Your Body on Om Times Radio with inventor, author, engineer, and rebel Gail Lynn. Gail has over three decades of solving her own health mysteries and then helping thousands of others find a better quality of life through sound, light, frequency, and vibration. She has witnessed countless stories of people harming themselves, some resulting in death, just because they didn't know any better. Her hope is to educate people to be more discerning and critically think about the sources of information being researched as well as products and modalities being used to determine if or how they are biased and misleading. Don't Do Stupid Shit is inspiring, honest, authentic, and unapologetic. Listen now to laugh and learn from Gail Lynn and her guests as they discuss how to be more discerning with healers, energy modalities, what you put into your body, and most importantly, to listen to your body. Here is your host, Gail Lynn. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Miss Tammy. So nice to have you here. We were just kind of laughing in the chat, so I'm still <laughs> kind of laughing from that. <laughs> So yes, we'll keep, we'll you, never, you never know where those Canadians are lurking. <laughs> right? I had a call with a guy recently, um, and I had just gotten off the phone with my freight people, and we were having trouble with the customs paperwork in Canada. And I'm like, freaking Canada. And he was like, oh, <laughs> I live in Toronto. <laughs> Put in the mouth, Gail, which is so me. Yeah, uh, but here I'll tell you guys funny. a couple of jokes because I do this for for our producer Chris because he's he's a jokester. So you know, my grandpa was a huge inspiration for me, and you know, he started running a mile a day at age sixty five. Wow. He's seventy now, and nobody knows where he is. Wow, <laughs> there might be some more to that. <laughs> I definitely, he might be on to something. <laughs> oh, shoot. And then the other one was, um, so th they told my dad that he should put five colors on his plate every day to stay healthy. Hmm. And so recently he was asking, you know, I don't know why I have diabetes from my M&M diet. <laughs> All the colors. All the All colors. colors. <laughs> oh, so anyway, uh, but, but he used to, my dad used to say, um, he had to take his vitamins and he'd pop a handful of uh, plain M&Ms. <laughs> 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 okay, so here we go. So, um, so nice to have you here, Tammy. I'm really excited. Um, it's going to be a really fun talk because I just, we just dialogue, you know, so everybody gets to have this, um, you know, secret. They get to be in the room with us while we're secretly talking, so... Yeah. Um, so thank you, you so much. You're a lot of things. Here. Yeah, you're a lot of things. You know, you're um, you have so many different gifts and talents and stuff. But the one thing that I focused on when I read your bio was a health freedom spokesperson or a spokesperson for health freedom. Tell yeah. tell us more about that. Well, it's kind of come out of necessity. I mean, if you if you see what's going on in the world today, we know that that our health is is being threatened. And this is super important to me because through my experiences with health and allopathic medicine, I've come to learn the hard way, honestly, um, that you have to use discernment and that you can't just put your health in someone else's hands. Uh, the hardest lesson I learned was when my son was a vaccine injured. So he was two years old and um, my daughter was born premature and so, you know, with a premature baby, they're kind of scaring you from the get go, right? This is like, and you're scared anyway, because this baby was so tiny. I'd never seen a baby so tiny, right? She was like four pounds. And that was big for a preemie because she was significantly premature. So they kind of scare you from the get go. They tell you there's going to be all these problems and you should anticipate problems, right? Which is against my natural mindset to be looking for problems. I kind of like to come from things from the other side of the equation where I'm kind of looking for solutions, right? So I was kind of like, um, you know, that my, my bristles were up, 
from the beginning, right? Yeah. With that whole thing. Sure. Yeah. No, a lot of people mom. have told me, a lot of clients have told me that the doctor said, oh, your son's not going to live past eight. And she's like, no one gets to put an expiration date on my no. child. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right. And so here they were telling me she was going to have, you know, learning disabilities. She probably wouldn't walk on cue. She probably, you know, all these different things. And my, my husband and I are kind of just like, okay, whatever. Right. But we were still in the allopathic model. We still, you know, trusted to a, to a large degree that they knew what was right. Um, and so because she was born premature, they said that she was very susceptible to RSV, which is a respiratory infection that can be very um, harmful, especially to premature babies. So they kind of heavy handedly pushed us into this flu vaccine, which no, no one in my family had ever even had a flu vaccine. We just never thought it was something we needed. But with this new occurrence of having a family member that's, you know, maybe at risk as a premature baby, um, my instinct was no, from the get go, there was this little voice in me that's like, No, I don't, I don't think so. But I overrode that and I let them give us all a flu vaccine. And it was a short time after that, um, that my son came down with something called uh, thrombocytopenia. And it was incredibly scary. Uh, he was only about two and a half years old at the time. And he, his eyes were completely burst with blood vessels. So they were bloodied. And he was bruised all over his body, unexplainable bruising. I mean, you could touch him and leave, leave a bruise on him. So, you know, like any mother we were and father, we were panicked. We went straight to the ER and uh, they didn't really have answers for us. They were throwing around things like cancer and leukemia and, and other things of that nature. So it was a very, very scary time. Very scary. But my husband, being the kind of researcher, critical thinker that he is, uh, left the hospital to go do some research. And what he found was um, thrombocytopenia is actually uh, related to the flu vaccine. So he brought, he, they didn't know what was going on. He brought this information back to the hospital. And of course they were like, no, you know, but we'll look into this. And then they came back with a diagnosis of idiopathic thrombocytopenia, right? So they're saying what? there's no reason for it, right? Idiopathic yeah, yeah. No reason. Yeah. So at the time we just wanted our son to get better. You know, so we were in parent mode and healing mode and um, we just kind of left it like that, knowing for the next few years that more than, like that was the reason why was because of the flu shot. We found doctors like Dr. Tenpenny and we mm -hmm. started finding information that was on the inserts of the packet. So we knew that that's what it was. And so we started realizing that, hey, if we're just going to take the advice of these experts we're, we may not get the outcomes that we want with our health. Right. So that just led me being a mom of two now and wanting to have a healthy husband and a healthy family just led me to start investigating and finding answers for myself. How many and years ago was this? Well, my son's 20 now. So he wow. was, it's been 18 years of researching wow. and trial and error and understanding nutrition and going back to school and becoming a holistic nutritionist and being able to use this skill for my family and friends. And, and to educate, educate people because you yes. are such a huge advocate of, you know, inspiration and education. And, you know, the problem in the world now is we're all sicker than we've ever been. Absolutely. And so that's why I want to get into the why we have more disease with inflammation and mm -hmm. autoimmune, if you even believe in that. You know, I mean, emotionally, it could be self sabotage. But would your body ever really attack itself? Did, did yeah. God source give us a body that would ever attack itself? You have fatty liver from I think keto diets and all the anger, we've got heavy metal toxic loads, we've got stress number one killer in America. So you know, how did we get here? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think if you really analyze it, you can see it. I think it started many, many years ago with the onset of, um, you know, turning our food industry into entertainment, right? So back in the day, we ate for sustenance. We ate to nourish. We were purposeful with what we ate because we often ate seasonally. We ate with what was available to us, how, you know, God intended these things were available at this particular time in during the year. And maybe, hey, maybe that's what we need 
at that particular time in the year. Could could that be? Is, is there <laughs> an accident that God would have this the, these kind of fruits and vegetables growing at these kind of times of the year? Exactly. For our chakras, for our organs, for our... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So if you even look closer into foods, I just did a piece on this on my radio show last week, um, where we're talking about if you look at foods, like look at the carrot, if you slice it down the middle and you hold it up, it looks like an eye. And lo and behold, beta carotene is good for your eyes. You know, the tomato, if you open it up, it looks like the ventricles of a heart. And lo and behold, the tomato is good for your heart. Right. And the walnuts, the walnut for the brain. Yes. And why would, why would God or source protect the seeds of certain fruits and so protected in the middle of the, of the fruit or the vegetable and people throw the seeds away? I eat them. I, yeah. I only get seeded watermelons. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah. Fun. So it's kind of the code of nature. And not only that, we can take that even further when we realize that we have receptors in our body for all these nutrients that the that the earth provides us. We even have an endocannabinoid system right? That gets fed by endocannabinoids, by cannabinoids, right? So things like echinacea, cacao, it's not just it's not just CBD that feeds our endocannabinoid system. You know, there are other things that feed that system as well. So we have, we have to start connecting back to nature. And I, this is not a new thing, right? It, it, we, we've gotten lost in the whole technology progression is better, right? It's not necessarily progression that we need to be focusing on. We have to kind of step back and remember who we are and who we are connected to and what we are connected to. Because it's a very specific, I like to say, like, it's not complicated. It's, we're not a complicated system, but we're complex. And very good, we, very nice. we, we have to understand that it's so complex that we don't understand every part of it. But it's okay that we don't understand every part of it. What we do know is that the body is made to thrive and survive So this thinking of my body has turned on me, right? My body's against me. I have to fight cancer. I have to fight ALS. I have to fight all of these things, right? It's a very specific dynamic and it actually gives you, you know, we have weapons to fight products, right? They're providing you the weapons to fight. Maybe you don't need to fight. Maybe you need to listen. Yeah. Right? That's what it's, I've been trying to teach is we need to listen to our bodies. I mean, mm-hmm. if you fall down um, on the ski slopes, because I'm in Colorado, you're in Colorado, and you, three people fall down, one of them, nothing happens to you. One of them breaks their ankle. One of them hurts their shoulder and it's their right shoulder. There's a message there from our body that we need to listen to and people don't listen. Right. But we haven't been, we haven't been taught to listen. We've been taught to give up our agency to someone else who knows better. Now, you're never going to be able to convince me that the divine in me doesn't know what's right for me. Right. What we have to do is perfect our ability to listen. So instead of having a reaction to a symptom of fear, because that's, t- that's how we're trained, right? Sure. We, we feel a symptom and we instantly fight or flight and yeah. we, we feel fear because that's scary. Instead of that, we need to translate these symptoms as signals. These are signals coming in to communicate. Our body's trying to communicate with us. And these signals are also protective mechanisms, right? So instead of squashing a fever, we have to nurture a fever. We have to make sure it doesn't get too high to cause damage, but we have to understand that this is the body working through what it needs to work through to heal. Right. My mom always suppressed my fever. Um, And so now my body temperature at the normal ranges is like 96 degrees. Hmm. Just because she suppressed it so much, my body never really regulated a proper temperature. And she, I was the first born. So, you know, living in fear. Oh my God. Yes. 
Oh, my daughter's got a 99.8 <laughs> temperature. Oh my God, what do I do? Give her a Tylenol, right? So, oh yeah. yeah, I'm so familiar with the, yeah. the new mom thing. Definitely, yeah. I can relate to that for sure. Because <laughs> it is that way. You've got this tiny little baby and you love it so much. Oh my gosh, you love it so much. You just want to do everything right. Yeah. And um, so we tend to act out of fear. Yeah. But what we need to lean into is that um, we're mothers by nature. Yeah. And nobody is more nor more well equipped to make decisions for our babies than mothers. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. So and you have to... your intuition, you know, and you didn't yeah. listen to your intuition back when. That's right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think when we have a fever, our body heats up to kill off whatever it is in there and we have yeah. to let it run its course. That's like, so they say. That's right. That's right. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, your body dealt with, 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 uh, assault, some kind of assault it was dealing with, with fever, but me and my family, we don't get fevers. Yeah. Like we never get fevers, but my daughter will puke on the drop of a dime. <laughs> like she, so she I can't remember the last time pukes, I had a fever or totally the last fine. time I puked. Yeah. Right. Right. Just throw up and get it out. Yeah. And that's we, great. It's a great yeah. way to detox quickly and easily and get rid yeah. of it and go. Exactly. But the key takeaway is that we're all different, yeah. right? We cannot all be treated the, in the same fashion. Right. I know exactly what I have to do for my daughter to help her recover. And it's completely different than what I need to do for my son or for my husband to right. help them recover. They're all and So how totally do we different. expect a doctor to know every single billions of people's different bodies? Like we are our own best doctors. And when we go to a doctor and say, what's wrong with me? What do I take? We need to be more responsible and more discerning and say, okay, th this is what I've noticed. This is what's happening. These are my symptoms. This is what I think is going on. And then let the doctor be a team member with you to yes. help solve your problems. That's exactly it. Um, you know, you can't lead yourself through the dark right? You need, you need a team, a cooperative team that's going towards the same goal. And you're going to, you're going to need tools. Yeah. You're going to need tools. You know, your body's first reaction to assaults is fight or flight. Right. And so you have to recognize that and realize this may be affecting my signal system, right? So what part is the ailment? Where does the ailment start and the fight or flight start? Yeah. Right. So if we can peel back that layer of fight or flight, then we can get to the root problem. Okay, now what's really going on? Because, you know, the headache or the pressure you're feeling in your head or the anxiety or all of the different things. That, I mean, there's like 300 symptoms for, for being in an anxious state. Yeah. So if we can peel back some of those by calming the system, which is why I love the harmonic egg. I mean, I just, that is, that is just such a great tool. Well, there's nothing else on the market that really, there's not a, um, a pill that balances your autonomic nervous system and gets you out of fight or flight. There's just not, not. without consequence, right? right. With, with severe so consequences. That's and why you got another, you right. got another bag to deal and with. That's, that's why doctors are buying these. Like we just sold another one to two medical doctors, neurologists in California. Yeah. So and there's I, a medical have... doctor in Clearwater. So, you know, they're seeing that the do no harm model that they signed up for is doing harm with the prescription mm -hmm. meds. And so we have all this, you know, uh, I want to talk about the depleted soils. And so, yes, we want to eat healthy, yeah. but then we're, how do we replenish? How do we get some good vitamins and nutrients in our body when our soils are so depleted? And, you know, we've got all these different meds for all these different ailments and are they really helping us? Are they hurting us? Mm -hmm. And then when you go on something, they say, okay, now you're on it for the rest of your life. I think it's just to get the thing under control mm -hmm. and then find the food to be your medicine. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. There's, there should be a triage phase, right? If you, if you aren't living in prevention, which we all should be living in prevention, you have a doctor, right? That you tend to go to only when something's really bad, something's really wrong, right? We have to shift that mindset into what's my prevention plan treatment? What providers do I go to for prevention? Right. right. We have to start thinking that way. Whereas we've been kind of trained through the insurance model in this country to just sit and wait till something goes wrong and then, and then get treated. Right. Well, yeah. you're already in crisis at that point. 
And then so, you give all these diseases an address, my cancer, my Parkinson's, my yes. this, my, you give it an address when it's really a temporary thing that you just need to figure out why is your body sending you this message? And there's these, a set of books that I like. It's called Messages from the Body by Dr. Michael Lincoln. And, uh, you know, all my center owners use these books to help the clients determine what is the emotion behind this? What is your body trying to tell you? Yes. And that's a great point that the signals we are feeling can be multifaceted, right? They, they're not just necessarily a physical manifestation. They may have manifested in your emotions that then turned into tissue manifestation or, mm -hmm. or other things. So it's a multi-layered approach. We tend to think that our, our problems in health are, are, are solved with a silver bullet solution. It's one thing, right? It's one pill. It's one procedure. Mm -hmm. It's one, and it just isn't. Yeah. So that's where nutrition comes in. And, you know, working at with if you're in crisis mode, you're going to have to go through a triage period, right? You're going to have to start treating the fight or flight, get that calm down. Whew, okay, now I can start tackling some of these other issues. The body with, can't heal in fight or flight, just can't. Right. Yeah. You have to calm that that process down. And that comes, I think you calm fight or flight with confidence, right? Confidence and faith and connection to, you know, your to spirit, just connect yeah. that, hey, I'm a being and this body is working for me, not against me. Right. So I need Gratitude, to hope, yes. love, appreciation. As soon as you jump to fear and anger, you get that low vibration. And that's where disease lives, is in that low vibration. Exactly. And, you know, understanding, too, that we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Right? I mean, I was talking to one of my speakers from our health summit that's coming up. I wanted up you to talk 24th. about that. June 24th, lovely yeah. Colorado. <laughs> I'm speaking. Come, come see us. Yes. Come see yes. us. Yes. It's going to be so incredible. But I was talking real quick. We were talking about um, him speaking at, at our, our event and he was saying, you know, the best thing that ever happened to him was when he, his, he lost his leg. Yeah. It's the best thing that ever happened to him. And it breaks his heart to, to meet people and work with people who think the opposite, right? That their life is over, or that they want to lent, end their life because they've lost their leg. When in his life, it has become his purpose. Mm -hmm. It is the thing that woke him up into who he is today. And I know that's, that sounds like, you know, there's a term out there called like toxic positivity, right? Like, you know, you're just like too much positive. You're not, you're not, you're not uh, acknowledging the negative, right? Yeah. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about really connecting to your purpose and understanding that everything is happening to you for yeah. you, for you. Right. Right. And then you know, he's, he's expressing this gratitude now, you know, yes. with that, you know, everything is energy and there needs to be balance and, you know, there needs to be balance in the nervous system and balance and everything. But just like um, that was a exchange of energy for his education, yes. he lost his leg, just like people exchange time for money or, you know, well, we can get on a big um, soapbox of mine. You know, I don't think that what I give to the government is a balance of what they get what we get in return. <laughs> so there needs to be a better balance <laughs> there. But yeah, right yeah. now we're being abused by our government. I right, right. We're I, I was to be abused. I was looking up all the stuff. Where's our money going? We got our FDA, um, you know, and those drugs are killing people and making them sicker. Yes, yeah. sometimes they help. We've got the USDA. We've got, you know, organic food rules. I mean, and somebody yeah. made a joke the other day. They said it's organic. Um, and how they define organic is they only spray at night when no one's watching. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've got the farmers going out of business and then, you know, Monsanto kind of that, that term went away for a while, mm -hmm. but this is what I read about their website um, for what, how the government, it says their role ensures that our nation's meat, poultry, food supply is wholesome, safe, mm -hmm. and properly labeled. So define wholesome, right. safe, and properly labeled because that's that right. state did not resonate with me. <laughs> no, and that's that is quite a stretch, quite honestly, because <laughs> you know a lot of our livestock comes from China, and as long as it's processed here in the United States, it can be stamped with a label that says "Made in USA." Right. 
So there's all these kind of intricacies of, of the food system. And that so is that that's properly a huge labeled? Because to me, that is not properly no, labeled. Exactly. And I react from a lot of these. Okay, so when it says, I want you to talk to us a little bit. We'll have a commercial break in a minute. It started raining and thundering. And so it's all crazy here. Um, <laughs> I wanted you to talk to us about that because I react to even organic grass fed, you mm -hmm. know, they say no hormones or antibiotics. However, don't animals have natural hormones, you know? So mm -hmm. there's an, it, there's an issue I have with that labeling, you know? Yes. Yeah. A lot of the labeling there, there yeah. is definitely issue and we can definitely get into that for sure because it's not so much about organic anymore. Even that label has been corrupted. It's about where the source is coming from. Right. You know, is it regenerative practices? Yeah. And we went, yeah. After the break, we're going to definitely talk about regenerative farming because so now we're talking about the problem, but after yes. the break, we're going to talk about the solutions. Yes. But I really feel like, um, you know, we've been duped into believing certain things and what is healthy eating what is organic what is properly labeled what mm -hmm. is safe and what is wholesome yes you know, we all have different ideas about that but you went on this journey a long long yeah. time ago now and yes. it has really helped you to help educate us to help educate um the public and look at what you've done for your family and your children yes which is the biggest prize of all Right. The biggest prize of all is that neither one of my kids is having to go in and out of doctor's offices or even so much has been on antibiotics since that, you know, fateful day right, when my right. son was two and a half. So Everything that changed. Changed that energy, that balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a remarkable journey and I'm so grateful for it. And given what's happening today, um, you know, with all of the COVID nonsense and everything, I can't help but think that was preparation for what's happening today. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to go to commercial break. When we come back, we, we've been talking about the problem of, uh, you know, eating healthy and how do we get our nutrients? We're going to talk about some solutions, um, regenerative um, farming and agricultural issues and depletion in our soils. And so we will be back. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Om Times TV. Experience light and sound in your own home with Harmonic Egg Books and Music. Take a deeper dive into the inner workings of the Harmonic Egg through Gail Lynn's book, Unlocking the Ancient Secrets to Healing. Experience Harmonic Egg's consciously created music on USB. Over 10 hours of high-frequency, high-vibration, high-energy music created with love, integrity, and intention. And The Little Dragon and the Giant Egg hardcover book makes the perfect gift for young and old, holidays, birthdays, anytime. Order these and more at HarmonicEgg.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, welcome back. 
Thank you. So we've been talking about um, a lot of different problems that we have and, and why people are so sick. And we want to talk about some solutions. But also before we get into that, um, Tammy is putting on a health summit. And I want you to give the website to that for June 24th in Loveland, Colorado. Yes, please come out and see us. We have some fabulous speakers joining us. Gail is going to be there, which we're all looking forward to. That's going to be awesome. Um, and we're going to have Dr. Peter McCullough there. He's going to be talking to us about his work with the wellness clinic and whatnot. Um, Dr. Ben Tapper will be there. He has a really fascinating story about his journey through the last three years and what it's been like to be part of the disinformation dozen, which he was labeled by our government insanely. <laughs> that was just insane. Um, pa Patrick Wood is going to be there and he's going to be talking about technocracy and, and what that means for us with the coming onset of artificial intelligence. And oh my goodness. And then we have so many awesome local people that I've just been so blessed to meet great business owners, people who are in our own backyard that can provide us with health solutions that really work. Um, so this is the message for the health summit is to understand that, hey, you have options. You have options and you don't have to just, you know, go with whatever that one doctor in a white coat says. There are options out here and you should follow your own intuitive um, nudging to look into them and, and, and make your own decisions. Yeah. Discernment, discernment, discernment. Yeah. Yeah. So um, naturallyinspiredhealthsummit.com, right? Yes. Thank Woo! you. Naturallyinspiredhealthsummit.com. Super, Super yeah. excited. So let's talk about um, regenerative farming. And um, is there a difference between regenerative farming and regenerative agriculture? Um, that's a good question. I, I think probably scale might be the difference. You know, I think they, they, you can, you can term it um, however you like, but we, what we mostly see around us is industrialized farming, right? We're seeing massive farms that are pu pumping out product for the masses, things like corn, soybeans, mono, monoculture, right? They're doing one thing. Um, whereas regenerative farming actually works symbiotically. So it's multiple things coming out of one farm because that's how what nature intended, <laughs> right? When we monocrop, um, the soil becomes very depleted and we're not getting the same type of nutrients out of our food that say we were getting 50 years ago. In fact, it's significantly lower, right? So I, I think it's something like if you wanted to get the same spinach you had in 1950, it, you'd have to eat, or the same nutrients rather from the spinach you had in 1950, you'd have to eat like 60 cups of it today. It is just not the same food. And that bec that is because of the, the state of our soil. The, the well, and this is the thing. I don't think people understand. If you grow cucumbers in the same spot every year, those cucumbers are going to be less and less abundant. So my boyfriend planted cucumbers 10 years ago. And he had so many cucumbers. He was pickling them. He was yeah. giving them away. <laughs> and then he had you know an overabundance of tomatoes the next year and no cucumbers. And I told him, I said, babe, you've got to fertilize. You've got to switch the plants around and mm -hmm. you know, do different things. So is that kind of regenerative? Yes, farming? yes, certainly. That's one aspect of it for sure. But it's also having animals on your farm, right? Because the animals help feed the soil. It is so like for us, we're on our little homestead. We call 1890 homestead. This property is over 100 years old. And so and it's been... Um, I'm sure at one point it was probably industrialized. So we're kind of taking it back to a point where, you know, we have a few head of cattle that cattle it grazes on our pasture. Our chickens follow our cows, right? So they're aerating the, the, the pasture and they're eating from the cows and from the, the field itself. And so we also have bees, which is doing our pollinating. So it's this aspect that, you know, every piece of the puzzle kind of of the ecosystem to make the healthiest land and farm possible, it has to be this multi, multi crop, multifaceted um, polyculture if you'll say, yeah. right? Well, I was reading on holistic management, I guess it's holisticmanagement.com. And they said, you know, people are jumping on this bandwagon for money, you know, calling it regenerative farming, mm -hmm. but it's not really because there's balance between the land and the soil, but there's also balance between business and communities. 
Yes, that's a great point. Yes, that's a great point. And um, I interviewed Will Harris, and he's from White Oak Pastures. I've also interviewed Joel Salatin, both for my podcast. And um, that's that's something really interesting. In terms of Will Harris's operation, he's in Bluffington, um, Georgia. He's in Georgia, this little town. And, you know, his farm is now employing a, a huge amount of that town. Right. So they're they're working on that farm. They're buying from that farm and it's it's sustaining his whole community. And, and that is such a such a, you know, overlooked type of component to regenerative farming. Right. A lot of people will say yeah. accuse uh, the regenerative farming of not being able to scale. Well, you can't scale a regenerative farming. No, you're not going to want to scale in the terms of making regenerative farming, you know, huge, this huge farms that are regenerative. You're going to want to have many, many regenerative farming farms to feed into the community, to provide food locally. Because, you know, things like, I don't know if you've heard, Bill Gates has a new product out called Appeal. Yeah. And this is like a coating that he's putting on produce to make it last longer. Well, why, why do we even need that? We need that because we're so used to being able to eat whatever we want, whenever we want, even though it's not conducive with the current climate we're living in. But we want that. So we will ship things in from out, outside the country just to be able to have it on, you know, in the winter. Which yeah, that doesn't even have the nutrients. I mean, it's probably right. just dead. Um, I have a, a friend of mine up in New York and he said, I went and I saw this product, you know, the sticker, because they put the sticker on it that says it's this product. He said, So right. I see this museum quality granny apple granny apple, <laughs> you know, Smith, Granny Smith apple, sorry. And he goes, and I see this one that looks like crap. He goes, I'm buying the one that looks like crap. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Good. That's probably a good move. Because yes, this this coating has now even been approved in the organic space. So your organic food will have this sticker on it. So you need to be aware of that, you know, you need to be aware that this is happening. Um, and so I think I really believe that that's the way we take our food uh, system back is by promoting and recommending and buying straight from our community. You know, here in Colorado, we're really lucky, especially in Weld County, we have a lot of people in agriculture Miller Farms, Miller Farms. Yeah. and there's more popping up all the time you know that that are understanding this small batch beef they can provide for themselves and provide for the community and it's a far better product there's something called greenwashing or the green glean is what they call it and and basically what that means is that these giant corporations who are who are really just like coke and pepsi and nestle are are bringing products to market that look like organic products, right? They have the organic, they go through the organic certification because of course they have the money to do that. They bring this product and it, and it really is just greenwashed. You know, it still has a lot of chemicals in it. It still has, um, you know, it's, it's not made from a process like Will Harris's white Oak farms or like my chickens, right? I, I feed my chickens the best food I can. Right now they won't even eat the food because they'd rather eat the worms and whatnot from the, all the rain we've been getting. So, you know, you can't, and these chickens get put to bed every night, <laughs> tucked in, you know, and they get, they get awakened every morning and let out into the pasture. And so that is not what we're seeing with a lot of these green washed products. They're simply just doing what they need to do to get the label of organic Right. But um, well, that I doesn't that necessarily I mean, you know, an interesting thing about eggs, too, that I learned recently about hemp. We used to actually be the, the United States government, the Farm Bureau, used to mandate that all farmers grew at least a quarter of an acre of hemp. And the reason why they did that is because hemp draws heavy metals out of the soil. And it also puts, um, you know, like uh, CBD into the soil. And then our, our cattle and our chickens eat, get that. They get fed from the hemp, from the plant, the CBD. So back when, you know, hemp was part of farming, uh, chicken eggs used to contain CBD, which feeds the endocannabinoid system. Now, naturally. 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 
Yes, absolutely. Naturally, we're just getting it through our food supply. So that's just one example of hemp that's been kind of eradicated out of our food system. Um, you know, it's a very specific, again, back to the whole monoculture type of thinking, where if you're going to grow hemp, you just grow hemp. Well, everyone, every farmer should have a little bit of hemp on their fields, right to help with the soil and pulling out those things because it works actually just staggeringly well to and take out toxins. those little bugs that you flick and they roll, those people <laughs> have metals out of the, of the soils too. Oh my so goodness, I didn't I know like that. Yeah, they yeah. do, the little roly-poly potato bugs. Yeah, um, I had this just goes back tree. to the same system that, you know, it all, it's symbiotic. Every little thing yeah. feeds the next. And Everything this is why it's needed. so terrifying yeah. that Bill Gates and people like him want to mess with that system by putting out things like mosquitoes, fake mosquitoes and spraying the sun. And, you know, you're messing with a very complex system that you don't even understand. And we are all suffering the consequences of that. Yeah. Yeah. Two stories real quick. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you're saying. So I had a kumquat tree in my office and uh -huh. it did so well and it would produce all these little kumquats. If you haven't had a kumquat, they're awesome. It's like the orangey flavor, but the bitter lemon, it's hard. Yeah. you just eat the whole thing. You don't have to peel it, but I would eat this, these kumquats off this tree. And I remember having one about four o'clock in the afternoon and I was up until like three in the morning, just buzzing. <laughs> It had so much B12 or something in it. I don't know what, right. but it was fresh off the tree. So I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like it's a natural energy burst. So I went to the Asian market. I bought a, a little container of kumquats, one after another, after another, after another, eight, like five, six of them, nothing. So that's what really was revealing to me that all the stuff that we're getting is dead. We need to buy from the local farms. That it's, it's, it's almost when it's ripe and it's just coming off the, you know, off the farm, right. it's going to have the most nutrients in it. But yes. we have all this food that's been flown over, stored, it's been ripened. Radiated. Yeah, radiated. It gets radiated. Ripened unnaturally. It doesn't have the minerals in it. That's right. Is it hailing at your place? I can't tell, but I do okay. hear some thunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thunder and hail and rain and over here. But the other thing is too, like how we, we know that there's a natural thing. So the fire ants, you know, most people know the fire ants about fire ants if you live down south in Texas. Fire ants came into the United States through the port in Mobile, Alabama, and then they've just gotten everywhere. Well, the University of Texas and Austin put out the forward fly because the forward fly would lay an egg in the fire ant's neck and then its head would fall off. Yeah. Well, Fighting what nature with nature. Is <laughs> now done that have no natural predator here. What did we do? Right. What did we do? Right. We keep screwing right. up. Yes, yes. And, you know, as a contrast to that, you know, someone like um, Will Harris will use different species to, to fight off pests in his crops, right, without disrupting the balance of the ecosystem. But because, you know, we've kind of messed with it so much, we do have these invasive species that are affecting our crops, it's going to take time to get back to where we need to be. And that's why we need to start now. Yeah, we need to start so now. How do people do this maybe on their own property if they if they can? Yeah, I would highly recommend that that, you know, definitely connect with people in your area that are doing regenerative farming and who are producing products. But also, you know, there's more than one benefit to working your land. It's not just about the food that you yield. And, uh, you know, being able to provide some stuff, uh, you know, sustain your own family with food. It's also about the connection to your land. It brings on a whole new paradigm for you and, and it will improve your health. Just we were really meant to work our land for our food. I truly believe we were meant to live around our food in alongside of it because it, it, it brings so much gratitude to know that you've put in, put in the work and that this, this thing you grew yourself and you're, you're getting your feet and your hands in the soil and you care about the soil. And this is a symbiotic relationship all the way around, not just from like bee to flower, from chicken to cow, it goes right to us, to humans. Well, right? and you, we're part um, of it. I was taught by some people, some friends of mine a long time ago, if you put the seeds in your mouth that you're going to plant, so say you're planting some beets, put those little gnarly seeds in your mouth and swish them around, the, the, 
the plant and the vegetables will produce nourishment for you because they have your enzymes that they're oh, wow. programmed with. So you suck on the seeds and then put them into the ground and it really helps to the plant to nourish you specifically. And that That's makes so much very sense interesting. To me. It does make sense. So much sense <laughs> to me. I'm like, so I'm sucking on seeds and then I'm going to put them in the ground. I'm sure if anybody's watching me, they think I'm completely that shit crazy, which I am. I, and I love my land. When I first moved down yes. to my property, I got the C and D tuning forks and I'm bing, walking around mm -hmm. my property, clearing my property. My horse loves it here. People love it here. You guys have been here. Yes. It's just a peaceful place. Hard yes, to grow anything in the sand. Um, so you told me about the greenhouse that I'll learn about at the summit. I'm going to probably get that because I want to grow my own food, but then the wind comes, the hail comes, yeah. the rain comes and, and, and the sand here, it's really hard. So I've got to yeah. come up with something a little bit more sustainable sure. for me. And that's okay. a great way to do, you know, it's, it's your, if you're going to think about farming, you've got to kind of diversify, you got to have stuff in your, in your grow um, shelves in your garage, maybe, or you get a small greenhouse and you do some stuff outside and you try some raised beds and you try some yeah. row gardening, you got to do it kind of multiple ways. Um, because, you know, if you're a farmer, you know, you know, it can get wiped out, you're taking a risk, but you have to just trust the process and then diversify. And, um, you know, build your community, because ultimately, that's really where we find our support and and find that connectability is through community. Well, we have community garden plots here that are put on by the city, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go and rent a plot. And I've been in several community gardens when I live in apartments because, you know, what do you grow in an apartment on the little right. railing, you know, on the balcony? Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then when somebody has an overabundance of something, they're giving it away. They put it in a basket for anybody to take. Yes. Um, there were some homeless people that came onto the, the plots and were stealing our stuff. Um, but I guess that was a compliment, right? Because they're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, we got some natural, you know, healthy stuff we can take. Um, well, that's, that's definitely, I mean, the, the lower, um, you know, if someone's struggling with low income, it's difficult to get things fresh, you know, one, they can be, um, you know, we have something called food deserts, like in New Mexico, where reservations specifically, they don't really have access to fresh food, the, 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 the trucks that come through come through very seldom. And so they drop off things that are just in packages and boxes. Yeah. And Can't. so, yeah. yeah. And so in low income fam families, you do find that they are living in, in almost like a food desert that's self like that's inflicted upon them because they just can't take the risk to buy produce if it, if it goes bad or if it, you know, they need to make sure that they're spending their budget on food that they can consume. Yeah. And, you know, you buy bananas two days too, too late, you know, and they, they're gone. Yeah. They, they can go. Quickly. Well, I would have happily paid for this homeless person or people to have their own plot and have a community garden. So it was like $35 for the year. Yeah. And plant their own stuff because I, I had this watermelon, yay big. I had nurtured it, watered it, talked to it, turned it, and they stole it. <laughs> oh, I'm like, no. bitches. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was so <laughs> but this upset. is that. Imagine if everybody had a hand in our community and doing regenerative farming, you know, there, it always has baffled me. Like, why, why do we plant this vegetation in the middle of islands on our highways or whatever, just bushes that are like, we could be planting food there, Yeah, but we don't, oh, right. We, we plant things that are of no use. Yeah, and communities come in and take care of it. Yeah, I mean, there could be a lot of things. A lot so, of things. I know we got like ten minutes left, so let's see what else is on my list. Oh, and if we want to take our power back, we got to stop spending money on the crappy foods that they're trying to feed us. Because guess what? If they're not making money off of it, they're not going to give it to us. Because if we're not buying it and it's spoiling, they're going to give us something else. And we've seen a lot of these big businesses, big companies, start making everything organic. Because guess what? That's what people are buying. Right. And so but if we vote again, with our money. Mm -hmm. But again, they're kind of corrupting that system right? with greenwashing, right? So right. it's so important to know where your food is coming from because these, you know, I think we're down to like eight or nine major companies that own 
like 90 plus percent of our, the food we see on our shelves in, in the grocery stores. It's a very limited number now. We're under the impression that these are, you know, different companies that make every different product, but that's not the case, mm -hmm. you know, like Pepsi and Coke are into the chips and dip products, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's, it's and all water the, and, and everything. Water. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have to, they, you know, they package it one way for marketing, but when you, you know, kind of go behind the scenes, you can see, and a, a wonderful website I just like to use, and I have no affiliation with it, but it's called littlesis.org. And if you ever get into kind of looking, wanting to know who owns what and what, where things come from, this is a great place to kind of dip into and say, well, who's related to that product? Cause that seems a little strange, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great place to look at that. They have network maps that'll show you exactly who who owns what. So it's very interesting. But that's where the consumer comes into play because it isn't going to be industry that changes this. Yeah. They're not going to decide, oh, yeah, oh, we, we're we going to change everything we're doing because it's not good for the people's health. That's yeah. not going to happen. Nope, and it's not going to come money. from, that's right. It's not going to come from government mm -hmm. because they have no incentive to do it, right? They are getting paid by lobby groups, obscene amount of money, to make sure things keep moving along the way they are. Right. So and not we, labeling things like this is from China because they know we're not, we don't want to buy things from China right now. Right. And you know, look at the French and the Europeans when they put GMO bread out there, I think they had a protest. <laughs> I, I think they protested it. GMO bread. Yeah. And they I, don't even know what organic home. is in many of those countries. They don't know what organic is because they, they've, uh, I mean, people are surprised even growing, being raised in Canada and moving over to the U S there was a difference in the taste of food. Yeah. So when I first started eating dairy here in the United States, I thought something's not right with this. Yeah. Like this is taste different. And I couldn't put my finger on it. Well, when I started doing research, there are chemicals and dyes that are actually illegal to use in Canada yeah. and in, in European countries that are totally legal here in the U S. Yes. Yeah, so, so that's what I'm saying. Like we are, are we were get, they're taking so much money from us in this, in the, I guess the guys of we're protecting you, we're giving you yeah. wholesome, safe food, bullshit. Sorry. Yeah. They're not in mm -hmm. Europe. I mean, I have a, a girlfriend who can go eat cheese in Italy, but she can't eat cheese here. Yes. I, I was in Spain. That's very I would, common. I would definitely get sick if I ate some of the stuff that I ate in Spain, um, if I ate it here. And yeah, pastas, our producers chiming in and awesome. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, our pastas, I mean, so many things. So when I went to Spain, I ate everything. We were eating off the, the streets, the street food. I didn't get sick at all. Yeah. And, and so many people it think different, like you said. Yes, it tastes different. And my son even experienced it when he traveled to Costa Rica. He came back and said that their, their, their food is so good. It tastes so different. Yeah. Well, a lot of people think that they have a gluten um, intolerance or an yeah, allergy. Or celiac. Yeah. Yeah. Celiac. That is such a rare affliction. That, but, but you wouldn't know that now because so many people stay away from gluten because they think it's gluten that's causing it. When yeah. actuality, it's the glyphosate. Your yes. body is reacting to glyphosate. And we now know that glyphosate is found in human tissue. Yeah. So just like DuPont, right? We, we saw the Teflon that is found in everybody. Now that's yeah. DuPont's marker on humanity. That, that Teflon is found in our tissue. And yeah. now Monsanto's mark on humanity is that glyphosate is found in our tissues. Mm -hmm. These are, these are huge assaults against humanity. Well, and do I you remember the tomatoes. Like, okay, I can't eat a tomato off the store shelves. I just can't because mm -hmm. we grew, my dad had a great garden and we grew green beans and peppers and tomatoes and you know, everything I'd have a tomato sandwich and it tasted so yes. good. Tomatoes have no freaking flavor. You're right. And watermelon as well. I've noticed. There, is, yeah. So so here's it's, a question that came in. Is there yeah, watermelon? Is there a way to remove the glyphosate from our tissues? Well, that's a great question. I mean, you can I, I always say, um, always be detoxing. A B D. Yeah. A B D. A B D. Always be detoxing. Um, and I was going to say too, because I know it can become very overwhelming to think, oh my gosh, everything is toxic. Everything is toxic. And, you know, you can become really obsessive about you it. You can't live in fear. Yeah. You can't live in fear. And you have to understand that your body's super resilient too. 
Yeah. Right? You are resilient. And this thing is, this thing is designed to thrive. That's its yeah. purpose. It is designed to keep you alive. So, but always be detoxing. So, you know, using you eating with purpose, you know, clean eating, water, clean water, electrolytes, good minerals, hemp, plant-based. Hemp, hemp, yeah. Hemp, hemp is yep. a great thing. Of course, there's lots of supplements and stuff, but I always, you know, the, use discernment um, with dark leafy supplements. Greens. Dark leafing greens is another one. Discernment with supplements. We got three minutes left. We're not going to be able to get on that topic, but yeah, you cannot keep buying these supplements off the shelves with all the fillers and they're just Mm -hmm. taxing and toxifying your liver and kidneys. So yes. 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 Thank you for bringing that up. It was on my list, but we didn't get to it. And I knew this was going to happen with us. So So, yeah, but detoxing. So what's your best detoxing? What do you do for detoxing? And then Uh, I always, I always say the best detox is not putting it in not putting it in. Right. So that's the best way. Now your body is fully equipped with liver, kidneys, you know, mucous membranes, you have all this complex system that's made to detox. But if you're constantly putting stuff in, it gets bogged down. So the best first approach I say is stop putting it in. See yeah. what you can cut back down on, right? Get, cut your burden in half. Make that your first goal. Yeah. So if you know that you're putting things into your body that have high levels of mercury or, you know, are, are toxic, that's the place you start. And then you let your body work through that. And of course, you know, using modalities like Epsom salt baths, the harmonic egg, making sure that your frequency is high, making sure that you're connecting, right? You're connecting to the earth and you're, you're living with purpose. It's about lifestyle. It's not about fad diets and detoxes and, you know, the the lemon, pepper, cayenne, whatever that, those things, you know, they're very temporary. And so what you want to do is look, look long-term diets are, diets are old news. That was the eighties. We, we now understand that it's a lifestyle. Lifestyle. That's term. why. Yep. That's why lifestyle. Okay. We are like 30 seconds. Tell people how to reach okay. you. Yes. You can you connect with me at naturally inspired health summit.com right now. You can just put in a ticket. I am on the radio four days a week, starting um, two weeks from now. And on Saturdays right now on KHNC here in Johnstown at 1360 AM, the lion. So tune in on Saturdays for the naturally inspired radio show. And then you can always drop me a line, you know, through naturally inspired podcasts, drop me a ticket and just ask questions. I, I love to connect. Well, I love you. Thank you so much for being on and I will see you soon. Yes. Thank you, Gail. Thank you for being such an inspiration. This show is not intended to diagnose, prevent, or treat any diseases or illnesses. The information presented within cannot substitute the advice of your physician or other trained healthcare professionals. The content of this show is for educational purposes only and is the expressed opinion of the show host and guests.